Great. So I think we should get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're really delighted to have you join us for this online webinar. I'm Ashley Boren. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainable Conservation, a nonprofit that brings Californians together to solve our state's toughest environmental challenges. This is the first of our Check In and Connect series. Let me get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, this is the first of our Check In and Connect series. Like you, we're working from home, caring for children, cooking more than normal, and running our lives in isolation. We understand many are struggling with various issues related to the pandemic, and all of us at Sustainable Conservation want you to know that we are with you and to also assure you that we are working as hard as ever for a sustainable water future for California's environment, economy, and people. For the moment, we're unable to meet in person, so we've launched this uh, web series as part of our Check In and Connect campaign in order to provide you with opportunities to stay engaged and connect around issues we all care about. Please continue to check in and connect with our community through webinars, blogs, happy hours, and our website. So I first want to cover a few logistics. Um, first, we have you all in a listen-only mode. I'm going to talk and share slides with you for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen for questions. Hannah and Susan from our team uh, will monitor that box and send questions to me to answer. If you've got any technical issues with Zoom, please let us know through the chat box also at the bottom of your screen, and Hannah or Susan will help you. Also, I want to let you know um, that we are recording this webinar. And we will um, be sending it out, a link to it, in a follow-up email. And I understand that there's a, some complaints about the audio. Um, I Let's see if I can, I can try to speak a little bit more directly into the microphone. I hope that helps. Um, so before we get started, let's do a poll to see how, how, who we have joining us today. There were over 200 people who signed up. So my first question for you is, where are you calling in from today? Great. It looks like we've got people from all over the state, quite a few from the Bay Area, and it looks like we've also got some folks from out of state. Oh, let's see. Um, did everyone get to see those? I hope so. Um, next question is, uh, what type of organization are you, is your primary affiliation? Great. It looks like, let's share those results. Looks like we've got quite a diversity of folks, uh, quite a few from the nonprofit sector, but um, really uh, folks from all the various constituencies with which sustainable conservation works. So our last question before we get started is, how would you rate your knowledge level on water issues in California? High, medium, or low? Great. Also a diversity with quite a few. Let's share these results now, Hannah. Also uh, quite a range. For some of you who've got expertise, maybe probably more knowledge than I have, uh, some in the middle and then some with low. So this presentation is really aimed at, at kind of um, a limited amount of uh, expertise. So hopefully it'll, there will be something in it for everyone. Um, so let's get started. The environmental challenge sustainable conservation is currently focused on is water and helping California adapt to climate change and the more volatile weather it is bringing to California. And that's what I'll talk about today. But first, a bit about sustainable conservation for those of you who are not familiar with us. Let me 
trying to advance my slides here. Bear with me. There we go. Um, for 25 years, we have engineered common sense solutions for managing California's land, air, and water. And we do this in ways that make environmental and economic sense, incorporating the perspectives and needs of all stakeholders. So business, government, farmers, city residents, conservationists, scientists, and most of all, the people and wildlife of California. Our approach is to build partnerships by finding common ground and by appealing to the desire of Californians to conserve the natural resources and the beautiful habitats that make California such a special and iconic place. And then I'm also gonna give you a little bit about me and what brought me to sustainable conservation. I love nature, but I grew up in Los Angeles where there was just not a lot of it. But luckily for me, my family vacationed in the Sierra Nevada, the California desert and at the beach. And my love for those landscapes inspired me to major in biology at Stanford and after graduation to venture beyond California to see more of the world by working with the Nature Conservancy in Latin America for four years. Through my travels in Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Mexico, I learned that the traditional approach to conservation, which then really involved buying land, locking it up, and keeping people out, was really alienating local populations. And the approach really just felt wrong to me. While the goals were admirable, the practice of closing off land pitted local people against conservationists. And conservation cannot succeed if it pits one set of interests against another. It leads to failure, whether in the form of resistance, sabotage, or even violence. I thought that there had to be a better approach through collaboration and in making conservation economically attractive. So that means creating incentives so that different people can buy into a common goal, even if they have different reasons for doing so. For example, dairy farms in the Central Valley and in Marin County, let me advance to this next slide, um, are California's largest emitters of methane, a greenhouse gas 30 times more powerful than carbon. There is now technology that enables dairy farmers to capture that methane and turn it into renewable energy that powers the farm. And in the case of Albert Strauss, of Strauss family creamery frame, his electric car. So cow power is the kind of win-win we'd like to see more of. What I saw in Latin America encouraged me to go back to Stanford. I got an MBA and a master's in applied economics. And then I went to Smith & Hawken, the garden supply company in its early days. My experience there was fantastic training for my work today. Sustainable conservation is the perfect blend of my environmental and economic interests. At Sustainable Conservation, we respect business and want to find common ground with all businesses and incentivize them to be stewards of our natural resources. We don't treat business as the enemy. Today, I'm gonna to talk with you about a critical aspect of life in California that is a is changing for businesses, farmers, residents, and our wildlife. And that is our new water reality. Water in California has always been a contentious topic, one that has long been shaped by limits and tested by big shifts in population. And all of this is made more intense by a changing climate and more volatile weather. I'm not here to scare you. My goal is to share the valuable knowledge sustainable conservation has gathered over the past 26 years and I hope I can enlist you to work with us in supporting pragmatic water policies that have proven successful as we adapt to California's new normal. I look forward to your questions, but first I'd like to share some background about California's water history and how dynamic weather events are intensifying an already challenging reality. I'll start with the basic plumbing, where California's water comes from, where it goes, and who gets what along the way. Most of California's water comes in the form of rain or melting snowpack. With the intense storm events over the past several years, you have probably heard a lot about atmospheric rivers. What do we mean by that? It's exactly what it sounds like. Narrow jets of air that carry huge amounts of water vapor from the tropics. NASA estimates that each of these rivers carries a water load equivalent to 25 Mississippi rivers. With climate change, these airborne rivers will strike more frequently and more intensely from now on. 
But even with all the rain we got in 2017, 2019, and in some parts of the state this year, we are not out of trouble when it comes to drought. Our changing climate means that we will have more severe and frequent ex weather extremes. The cycles of heavy rainfall in the form of these atmospheric rivers are followed by inevitable drought. Thankfully, we've developed ways to store some of the rain, and that's important in order to avoid wasting rainwater. Rainwater in California is often runoff water. It's as if you made a habit of scraping your dinner leftovers into the compost or the disposal instead of putting your pasta or your minestrone in a container and enjoying it for lunch the next day. Most of our white rainwater rushes down concrete streets, canals, paved over riverbanks, and it's gone, literally down the drain. Last year, the Los Angeles Times reported that 80% of Southern California's rainfall runs off and is wasted. 80%. And put another way, the amount of runoff from just one big storm in Los Angeles could supply the city's whole population with water for an entire year. That's waste on a pretty massive scale, and that's something we really need to fix, and I'm going to share some proven approaches with you. The rainwater that doesn't rush out to sea gets stored either in surface reservoirs or in the snowpack of the Sierra Nevada, California's largest reservoir. We also get water from the Colorado River. It's a major water source for Southern California cities and farms. This river water is shared among seven states and Mexico. So to summarize, rain, snowpack, and the Colorado River are California's key sources of surface water. We also have tremendous reserves of groundwater. I know these terms can be confusing, so let me explain the key difference between surface water and groundwater. Surface water is found in lakes, rivers, and streams, and snowpack, while groundwater is found in the spaces underneath the earth in geologic formations of soil, sand, and rocks called aquifers. So as the name suggests, surface water is above ground and groundwater is below. Think of groundwater as our savings account for the years it doesn't rain as much. We draw it down for drinking and agriculture and manufacturing, and like any savings account, we have to replenish it. Here too, California has struggled. It wasn't until 2014 that California passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, making it the last Western state to regulate the use of groundwater. This was California's first major water law in a century, and it was passed during a major drought when we finally mustered the political will to take action. Regulating groundwater is the stuff of water wars, so it's not hard to understand why politicians prefer to steer clear. By the way, the blue on the map of California represents all of the state's groundwater basins. Imagine hundreds of soda straws, maybe thousands, no one really knows, sucking on the same aquifers. Many of you have heard about people's wells running dry and not having any water coming out of the taps in their homes. We are also seeing the damage of drawing too much water out of, aqua, out of the aquifers. Trying to advance my slides, hold on. There we go. Uh, uh, when we see cracked roads and bridges and other structures like this aqueduct, which is cracked due to the land sinking. But we can't point to the single straw causing the problem. So everyone leaves their straw right where it is, unless, of course, they stick it in a little deeper to get away from all the other straws. This will change as the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act goes into effect between now and 2040. But it's going to take decades to repair the damage and recharge the aquifers. If you imagine an aquifer as a sponge, recharging it is the process of adding water to that dried out sponge and making it moist again. So the challenge is to redirect some of the surface water back into the aquifers, and sustainable conservation has some methods that do that. So storage and recharge are two essential elements of improving California's water health. So now let's get back to who gets what. If you watch the classic movie Chinatown, I don't have to tell you that who gets water and at what cost has long been the subject of contention in California, and for that matter, the entire American West. 
And it gets tougher when you consider that California has grown a lot since the water wars of the 1930s. It is now home to 40 million people, about one in every eight U.S. residents. California is the world's fifth largest economy. It's also the country's largest agricultural state. California supplies two-thirds of the country's fruit and nuts, one-third of its vegetables, and 20% of its dairy products. So it's no wonder that USA Today called California the nation's salad bowl. Although the majority of Californians live in urban areas, they use only 20% of its developed water. And now when I say developed water, I mean water that is stored and managed for various human purposes. The number one use of Californians' water is, of course, agriculture. And this is the source of many controversies and misunderstandings. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google how much water does it take to grow an almond. During our most recent drought, tension between urban users versus farmers was focused on this tiny but mighty almond. Mother Jones magazine even ran a cover image of an almond with Dracula fans. And really, I can't make that up. On the flip side, California farmers have a lot to say about how our water has been managed and, in their opinion, badly mismanaged. If you've driven on I-5 through the Central Valley, you've seen the billboards. Many farmers think Californians don't understand or appreciate the people who provide their food and who have made this the most productive agricultural region in the world. There are huge gaps of knowledge and a lot of confusion and misinformation about just who in California is a water waster. You You may remember the glee many got during the most recent drought from the articles and websites sites shaming the rich and famous in California by name and numbers of gallons used for their lavish lawns, golf courses, swimming pools, and front yard fountains. In fact, some of my favorite giant baseball players were taken to task. It gets a lot more extreme when you add farmers into the mix. Depending on how you measure it, agriculture uses about four times the amount of developed water in California each year as do people in cities and suburbs. But here's the big point. It takes water to grow food, and food is made up mostly of water. As one of only five Mediterranean climates in the world, California is able to produce abundant amounts of healthy, nutrient-dense crops. And that's something to be celebrated, not to feel guilty about. We are very fortunate to be able to source our foodie habits locally and to export the bounty to the rest of the world. So now I've covered where water comes from, how it gets stored, where it gets wasted, and who uses it. The next big challenge is how to move it. Rain in California typically falls more heavily in the northern part of the state and is redirected for use in the population centers of the Bay Area and Southern California and in the huge agricultural region of the San Joaquin Valley. The story of water in California is a story of transporting it from where it falls or gets stored to where people and farms need it. California's plumbing systems are a complex network of reservoirs, canals, and groundwater storage sites linking major water supplies to major water demand centers. Water stored during wet wet winter and spring months is then available for use during dry summers and are increasingly frequent droughts. So who built all this? I'm going to give you a very simplified schematic of the major parts of California's plumbing system. This is the Sacramento River, the principal river in Northern California and the largest river in California. Coming in from the right is the San Joaquin River, which starts high in the Sierra Nevada and runs 366 miles through the Delta and into San Francisco Bay. The Los Angeles Aqueduct carries water from the Eastern Sierra Nevada to Los Angeles. The construction of the aqueduct marked the first major water delivery project in California. It's the story that the movie Chinatown is based on, the city purchasing 300,000 acres of land, often secretly, in the Owings Valley in order to gain access to water rights. To restore Mono Lake, correct air quality law violations caused by the dust that was created as the valley dried up, and rewater portions of the Owings River, Los Angeles has begun to reduce its dependence on eastern Sierra Nevada water, mostly through water conservation. Two major federal projects were built in the 1930s. The first was the completion of Hoover Dam, which created Lake Mead, represented by that teal circle on the map. 
Hoover Dam enabled Colorado River water to be stored and distributed, including to California, through the Colorado Aqueduct. The second federal project was the Central Valley Project, which was created by the federal government to provide irrigation and municipal water from reservoirs in the northern half of the state to the Central Valley. This major water project was actually initiated by the state, but because of the Great Depression, the federal government had to step in to build it. And thanks to the irrigation made possible by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, the semi arid San Joaquin Valley was transformed into the world's most productive agricultural region. Another huge transfer began in 1960 with the State Water Project under the management of our State Department of Water Resources. It was the brainchild of Governor Pat Brown and a passion carried on by his son, former Governor Jerry Brown. California's aquatic lifeline brings water from Northern California to Southern California through a series of reservoirs in the Central Valley and then pumping it up and over the Tehachapi Mountains to Los Angeles, which is the biggest lift of water in the world. A final critical element of the system is the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. The Delta is the terminus of California's largest wa watershed and a major water supply hub. The San Francisco Bay and Delta combined form the largest estuary on the U.S. Pacific Coast. Water from the Sacramento and the San Joaquin Rivers comes into the Delta and is, the, and is then exported out of the southern delta to more than 25 million people and 3 million acres of irrigated farmland in the Bay Area, the San Joaquin Valley, and Southern California. So as you can see, California moves huge quantities of water over vast distances and challenging terrain at enormous costs. The important points to take away from this simplified map of California's plumbing system is that it's immense, it's expensive, outdated, and really complex to manage. To add to this, California has over 500, 500 independent water agencies managing water. This makes it very difficult to coordinate the competing priorities of different jurisdictions. These priorities include flood protection, water supply, reducing environmental harm from dams, addressing long-term excess pumping and pollution of groundwater, maintaining and updating infrastructure, and adapting to a smaller snowpack and more intense storms as the climate warms. And our infrastructure is creaky at best. The failed spillway at Oroville Dam, which is part of the State Water Project, is one example that's been in the headlines, but there are many fragile structures around the state. Climate change is making each of these factors even more challenging. Our water system was designed for the hydrology and weather patterns of the 20th century. It really is completely inadequate for the realities of a changing climate. We see the same thing with fire, another feature of life in California. Firefighters are learning that established fire science has been overtaken by new realities that are making our wildfires more difficult to contain and control and leading to more tragic consequences with death tolls and property damage rising year after year to levels never seen before. Our water and climate scientists are telling us something similar that new water models are changing nearly as quickly as the climate. This is a picture of, um, from a satellite of the Sierra Nevada in February 2019, when we had a snowpack of 150% of average. By the end of this century, some models show that the Sierra snowpack will shrink by 80%, which will look much more like what our snowpack looked like in 2015, at the height of our most recent severe drought. So let that sink in an 80% reduction in snowpack in the Sierra Nevada, and the Sierra Nevada is our biggest reservoir. This means that California's water will come in the form of rain in the future, not snow, and if we don't figure out how to capture it, it will go out to sea. And we can't afford that kind of waste in an era of climate change when already 1 million Californians did not have access to clean drinking water in our most recent drought. Other water challenges are also getting more intense as the climate changes and as the, the, as the pace of change accelerates. These changes include warmer temperatures, shorter winters, more volatile precipitation with wetter wet years and drier dry years, and rising seas. Now I know this all sounds troubling, and it is, but we already have many of the answers to these problems and we need to get to work. 
fast. The changing climate and the increasingly rapid pace of the change means that we have to adapt how we manage water. Fortunately, California has already taken one major step with the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which I mentioned earlier. It is perhaps California's most important climate adaptation strategy. We have to continue to implement the law. An important first step is the groundwater sustainability plans that the first group of water agencies submitted in January of this year. These plans must show how these water agencies will bring their groundwater aquifers into balance so that over time, farmers and cities are not taking out more water than they're putting back in. Ground zero is the Great San Joaquin Valley, where groundwater overdraft has been the most severe. All the areas in purple on this map are critically overdrafted basins, and you can see they essentially cover all of the San Joaquin Valley. To get into balance, this region must reduce its water use by 15%. Now, 15% may not sound like a lot, but that's the equivalent to the amount of water for two to three million homes for one year. Remember how much water is wasted in one storm worth of runoff in Los Angeles? We should be able to fix this. Now, because agriculture uses nearly 90% of the water in the San Joaquin Valley, farmers will need to either pump less, recharge more, or most likely some combination of both. Sustainable conservation is helping implement the groundwater law by helping water agencies and farmers capture that water in high water years, excess floodwaters not needed for fish and wildlife that would otherwise flow out to the sea and sometimes flood communities like Gurnville in the process. We're advocating that we let nature do what it used to do, but in a more managed way. Before we had agriculture in cities in the Central Valley, the rivers that came out of the Sierra Nevada, particularly with heavy snowmelt, spread out across the valley. It was basically one gigantic wetland. We advocate policies that let those rivers flow out again, but in a more managed way. We can direct those high water flows to farmland with good sandy soils that percolate water quickly through the surface and into the aquifer. Fallow land and land with crops such as grapes, pistachios, and alfalfa are especially good for this kind of flooding. Citrus and cherries, on the other hand, do not tolerate this kind of flooding of the fields. We were introduced to the concept of percolating water through active farmland and back into the aquifer by a farmer named Don Cameron, who you see here in this picture. Don farms at the end of the Kings River in Fresno County and is entirely dependent on groundwater to irrigate his six 6,000 acres of crops. The Kings River regularly floods, so he got the idea to let it flood onto his land with the purpose of recharging the groundwater aquifer below him. In 2011, 2017, and 2019, all high water years, he was able to recharge significant amounts of water with no impact on the health or yield of his crops. There's great potential for this low cost method of groundwater recharge across the San Joaquin Valley and sustainable conservation is actively conducting research and outreach in developing the tools and policy to make this standard practice. Capturing the water that would otherwise flow out to sea could address up to one third of the San Joaquin Valley's groundwater overdraft problem. Capturing water in our high water years will help increase our water supply, but it will also reduce flood risk for communities and it can also increase habitat for fish and wildlife. We can move from our channelized rivers that move water out to sea as quickly as possible to giving those rivers more room to spread and to slow down, allowing for recharge, reducing flood risk, and restoring floodplains, which are crucial habitat for salmon. If you've ever driven to Sacramento in the winter, you've driven over the Yolo Bypass and all the rice fields that are very full with water, protecting Sacramento from flooding and providing great habitat for fish and wildlife. We need more of these types of areas across the Central Valley. So before I wrap up, what can we all do? You can continue to get educated about water in California. It's a fascinating and absolutely critical topic for all Californians to understand. Let's stop blaming and start rewarding and appreciating everyone who makes progress, whether it's the city dweller who replaces a lawn, the farmer who takes the risk to recharge the groundwater, another farmer who transitions to drip irrigation to grow their crops, a manufacturer who goes to zero waste of water at their facility, or even the kid next door who adopts a storm drain. 
You can support your fellow Californians, whether it be Southern Californians who have greatly increased their water use efficiency or farmers who have also gotten much more efficient. Let's be different than Washington, D.C. and be one California with one water ecosystem and work together to ensure we can continue to supply California and the nation with healthy and nutritious food. We can assure all Californians have clean drinking water and that our fish and wildlife thrive. And consider drought tolerant landscapes for your home. Half of water use in urban areas goes to landscaping. Reducing our outdoor water use is a huge opportunity to support the rest of the state. So the story of water in California has always been dramatic, a competition for scarce resources, often resulting in open conflict and some good movies. But the story of water in California also shows ingenuity, determination, remarkable engineering achievements, social change on a massive scale, and economic growth. Adapting to the extremes caused by climate change will demand an even greater effort. But Californians are up to the challenge. We always have been. So I've outlined some of the ways California can create a 21st century water system and remain a world leader in economic and environmental terms. I hope you'll join sustainable conservation and supporting policies that make us smarter and more sustainable water users. And now I'll be glad to take uh, questions. Let me. Oh, sharing my screen. Let's see. Get back to the video. Hold on with me, folks. <laughs> There we go. Um, okay, I would be happy to take some questions. Let me look. I'm going to look in the Q&A box. Uh, first question, will we be getting this recording? If this was a lot of great information to digest. Yes, we will be sending you a follow-up email with a link to the, report, the, the recording. Um, what are some, second question, what are some examples of policies that make recharging aquifers more feasible or incentivized? Um, well, one example would be creating incentives for the farmers who do take the risk. While Don Cameron uh, may have not had any uh, impact on the yield or health of his crops, a lot of farmers are quite concerned about this practice. Um, so that's one of the reasons sustainable conservation is doing so much research on demonstration sites um, and learning from the experiences that farmers have. So providing an incentive to help them, uh, you know, manage that risk is an important, important piece. Um, also figuring out how to um, expedite the, the permits to be able to capture excess water is an important uh, policy that needs to be passed and it needs to be done in a smart way that ensures that fish and wildlife get the water they need in high water years. Um, and this is really talking about that excess uh, flood water to, to recharge. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, Sigma was designed to allow, this is the question, Sigma was designed to allow local municipalities and communities to make decisions about groundwater management in their area. How successful has this been at capturing the needs of everyone in the community? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and that was definitely the intention of Sigma um, was to not have a one size fits all approach for managing groundwater, but to let local regions determine what, how, what management decisions they wanted to make. But an important piece of that is engaging all the users of water in a particular region. And some areas have done a better job than others. There are definitely areas that have not captured or heard all of the needs and interests of their communities. And that's something that needs to be strengthened going forward. I'm gonna go on to the next uh, question. Uh, how large is the opportunity for more efficient water use, both in agriculture and in cities? Um, Another great question. So uh, in cities, uh, really the, the biggest opportunity in urban areas is outdoor landscaping. As I mentioned, we use half of the water we use in urban areas is for outdoor landscaping. So that's where the biggest opportunity lies. Um, on, with agriculture, um, 
the key is agriculture in California has gotten a lot more water use efficient over the years, um, significantly so. Um, but before we had the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, becoming more water use efficient didn't necessarily mean that you used less water because you might plant additional acreage. Now that there are going to be limits on how much water can be pumped from our underground aquifers, more efficient water use will um, definitely improve our sustainability. Uh, let's see. Another question of how much of a role can water reuse reclamation play? Um, uh, this is a really important uh, issue, particularly in coastal areas. Um, if you think about a place like the San Joaquin Valley, which I've spent most of the time talking about today, all that water is contained really in a sense within a basin. Um, if you think about coastal areas, uh, there's real opportunity for water reuse. And I'll give one example, the Pajaro Valley uh, out in Santa Cruz County, they their groundwater uh, basin is suffers from seawater intrusion because of um, cities and agriculture pumping out more than is being recharged. And if the seawater continues to advance, it's going to pollute that whole groundwater basin. So they have a real priority to uh, bring that into sustainable management. And they're doing it through multiple strategies. Uh, one is agricultural efficiency. Another is some recharge, but the third and very important is water recycling or water reuse. So depending on where you are in the state, it can play a very important role. Um, I'm going to, uh, well, uh, I, what the next question is, what policies would you like to see urban water man agencies adopt? Um, we don't work, at, sustainable conservation doesn't work as much in urban areas, but I would say I'd love to see um, uh, some, um, policies around outdoor landscaping, because that really is such an important opportunity. Uh, and also, actually, I should also say, figuring out ways to capture stormwater, like the example in Los Angeles, figuring out how we can capture that water, uh, either sink it back into the aquifers underneath, you know, having more permeable surfaces that allows water to go into the aquifers. Those are actually all things urban areas, uh, urban water agencies could do. Okay, next question. Flood irrigation of crops and trees is already common. What's the difference between what you suggested and the flood irrigation that is already being done? Environmentalists often criticize flood irrigation because it uses so much more water than drip or other method. Many farmers spend a lot of money to upgrade to these low water user systems. This is a great question. Um, so when we talk about the type of flooding that Don Cameron did, as the example I showed in the presentation, I almost think about this as uber flooding. So it's it's putting more water, way more water on than you believe your crop could ever use. Um, flood irrigation that used to be done before many farmers transitioned to drip irrigation was really for the purpose of irrigating your crop. So they weren't necessarily going to put more on than they needed to, unless, of course, they they might put a little bit more on to help flush uh, salts down uh, through the soil profile. But I, what you raise in this question is kind of an, one of the ironies of all this is that I feel that society has really pushed farmers to become much more water use efficient. And now we're coming in and saying, oh, <laughs> actually, we do want you to flood irrigate. But the difference here is really what we'd ideally like is that the farmers in California that are on good soils for recharging groundwater are set up to do, have drip irrigation and be highly efficient during dry years and particularly droughts, but then can also switch over to kind of an uber flood system uh, in these high water years when it's so imperative that we cap cap uh, capture water. Um, one last thing on this point though is that as farmers did go to upgrade their systems to become more drip irrigated drip efficient, um, they actually got rid of their flood irrigation system. So it is going to be an expense to ensure that they can do both uh, depending on the, the water year. Uh, next question. All great questions. This is terrific. Um, for recharging aquifers, are there safety measures in place to not let toxins, for example, pesticides, oil refineries, et cetera, contaminate the groundwater? This is a really important question, and this is one where sustainable conservation is um, 
turning a lot of attention. We early on we did have a study. We were very focused on the um, on nitrate pollution because in the San Joaquin Valley, because of long time use of fertilizers and also uh, dairy manure as fertilizer, there is pretty serious uh, contamination of groundwater aquifers, including the groundwater aquifers that are drinking water sources for communities. So we want to figure out a way not to further deteriorate particularly good drinking water sources. But what we want to also explore is whether if you do recharge of aquifers on land that does not use as much nitrogen. So that's one of the reasons, for instance, that grapes are a great um, crop to do recharge. It, it, they are a low nitrogen user, so there's not going to be as much nitrogen in their soil. Having said that, because the San Joaquin Valley has been farmed for so long, there is nitrogen in all that soil. So one of the things we're exploring is probably makes more sense to do recharge on the same lands uh, in large quantities over and over again than to spread it out and do it over a lot of land. Because once you flush that first wave of nitrogen into the groundwater, the next after that, when you're putting clean water on top of that water that went before, you actually are going to start diluting the system over time and improving water quality. So these are various factors that are still being researched and figured out and are very important places to, to focus. Okay, uh, next question. Do you see any large-scale plans on the horizon for maintaining or updating the out-of-date plumbing infrastructure in California and or integrating that old technology with new solutions for storage and movement of water? Um, I do see um, the beginning of that, and I will say... Um, our California Department of Water Resources, uh, their integrated water management program is really um, thinking ahead and very in a very comprehensive and integrated way about how we manage water for uh, what's termed multiple benefits. So how do we manage water for people, for recharge and storage, for habitat? And um, we're actually involved in a pilot program with them on in the Merced River watershed where we are using the Department of Water Resources climate scenarios for runoff in that watershed under different scenarios, how much will come down, and particularly in these flood events, and is there enough farm and other land to be able to take that water and sink it into the groundwater and prevent flooding of communities like the city of Merced. Um, and then it's going to connect into the groundwater model. That's the kind of modeling and information we need to get out to all of the watersheds coming out of the Sierra Nevada so that the municipalities and the water agencies can plan for our future with, with the effects of climate change. So that is one scenario where I see um, some good thinking going on, but there is much more needed um, because we really do have a lot of uh, outdated um, and antiquated uh, infrastructure. Uh, next question, what are some quick steps communities can take to capture more stormwater runoff? I don't know if anything is quick these days, um, but I do think trying to change surfaces from um, non-permeable to permeable is one. Um, uh, so that's, I think, the best answer I can come up with on that one. Sorry, I don't have more quick step ideas. Um, Next question, what are ways we can capture the stormwater runoff for recharge and how to protect, protect aquifers from pollution in stormwater? I think I've covered those in previous questions. Um, let me go on to this next one. Why can't we increase our water storage on the rivers from the mountains? We can retain the excess water in wet years to use in dry years. So, if I reading this question right, I think the um, it, it, it's asking why. I think you're referring maybe to above ground reservoirs. Um, we and I will give you a fact that I think is made a big impression on me when I first heard it. We have at least three, and sometimes people say ten times the storage capacity in our underground aquifers 
than we have in all of our above ground reservoirs combined. And the fact is we have dammed basically all of our rivers. There really are no other reservoirs to build. And then in addition, of course, building dams cause quite significant environmental harm, particularly for our fish species. So, and they're very expensive um, and very difficult to permit. So we think groundwater storage is just a much more cost-effective way uh, and more environmentally sound way to store water. Um, and particularly given these, um, these volatile storm events we're gonna get, where we're gonna get storms where you have so much water coming down at, at once that you've got to figure out how to slow that down and spread it out. I don't think you could do that adequately just with above ground uh, storage. Uh, next question. When farms flood and the water eventually recedes, how does that affect sensitive fish populations, parentheses salmon, are fish strandings a problem? Uh, great question. Um, for the kind of flood irrigation for groundwater recharge that I'm talking about, um, most of this water is coming, well, it is coming off of rivers like the Kings River um, and canals. We have not seen that issue of um, fish stranding being uh, a, a, a issue at all in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, where that where there is some concern about that, but I think they're working that all out is um, Cal Trout's doing some great work um, with the California Rice Commission and rice growers on using rice fields to help um, fatten up baby salmon so that they can better um, survive the trip back to the ocean. And there was some concern about uh, fish stranding for those populations, but they are really thinking that through and figuring out how to prevent that from happening. Okay, please talk about the role of soil health improvement. Can it be done in the San Juan King Valley, and if so, where? So soil health improvement is a really important uh, thing for lots of reasons. Uh, on the topic we're talking about today, improving soil health uh, actually improves soil water retention. So it, it's a great, uh, a, a great strategy for drought and using water more efficiently and managing water more efficiently. And also there are cases where um, improving soil health and organic con uh, content and using cover crops um, can help sequester carbon um, and also serve as habitat for beneficial insects. Um, this, can it be done in the San Joaquin Valley? I think so. And actually we are, uh, sustainable conservation is in the process of sort of doing a, uh, first starting with a literature review of what we think is possible and what's not to come up with some strategies about how we can work to improve soil health uh, in the valley. Uh, next question. As a landscape professional, I find that there is increased buy-in from clients for responsible water management. Any specific educational resources that you would recommend to us and to our clients? Um, well, one I'd do right off the bat is we, Sustainable Conservation, put out a garden guide for uh, California friendly plants, uh, which are water wise. So uh, I think that's on our website. If it's not, email us and we will, we will get that to you. Um, that's a great, uh, great source for uh, gardeners. And then there are some great just general water education resources, including the Water Education Foundation uh, is a great source um, with some good, good basics on uh, water in California. Okay, next question. What role does soil quality play in proper water management? And assuming it matters, do you think soil quality gets enough attention? Well, as I was mentioning on the earlier question, if you have more organic matter in your soil, you're gonna, uh, your soil is going to retain water better. So that is very important. And I actually don't think good soil quality gets enough attention. It's something that has so many benefits. Um, so it's something that, that should. We did have I think it was the year of the soil um, a few years back, and actually that did increase in tension on it, but um, it definitely needs more. Uh, next question. Can some of the fallow land in the Central Valley be used solely for groundwater recharge and storage? Uh, the answer is uh, theoretically yes. Um, in fact, um, I think protecting land that is particularly good for recharge and not allowing it to get paved over and develop 
would be a great strategy for the San Joaquin Valley to ensure that they have those areas where they can, can recharge groundwater. And that may be um, a good use of fallow land, uh, particularly if there's a way to compensate the landowner for that. Um, I'm going to actually, because we're uh, running short on time, I um, just want to, there was a couple of people who sent in questions ahead of time, and I'm just going to try to cover that. Here's one. As a participant on the Sierra Club's Bay Chapter Water Committee, I'm very interested in expected weather patterns in California and how we can make sufficient preparation, quote, in time, unquote, using our best information. So, you know, I, some key elements to act in time with these more intense weather events. One is um, planning using models of future climate scenarios uh, and their impact, such as the one I mentioned uh, with our work with the Department of Water Resources in the Merced River watershed. Another is really moving our reservoirs to be managed on a based on real-time forecast information instead of outdated uh, yield curves. That's another critical uh, piece of managing in time. And then lastly, you know, this ability to get the necessary rights and permits in a timely manner to divert high flows to recharge, flood protection, and, and environmental benefits is all important, too. Um, another question that came in was, uh, how can California support sustainable practices while draining the delta? And I would just say a healthy and functioning delta that works for everyone is an absolutely essential part of a sustainable water future for California. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to, you have, there's so many good questions today. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. I just want to take a few minutes to close. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, hold on. Back. There we go. Um, as I mentioned in the first, this is the first in a series of webinars and events that we're going to be putting on as part of our Check In and Connect campaign. Uh, we'd love to hear, since this was our first webinar, we'd really love to hear your feedback. So please take a few minutes to fill out the short survey we're going to send you. And also, if I didn't get to your question or you have others, please let us know and we'll get back to you with an answer. Um, as part of our Check In and Connect campaign, we'll be holding monthly webinars. And next month, we're going to be teaming up with Spawn, a nonprofit working to protect salmon in Marin, to learn about a fantastic restoration project they did to restore a floodplain on Loganitas Creek in Marin County. And it's a project that was made easier because of the expedited permits Sustainable Conservation has helped set up to make restoration easier and faster to do. So consider registering for that webinar, which will be on May 6th, and check back to our website for future webinars and other ways to connect with us. So um, until we connect next, please uh, do fill out that survey and take good care. And thank you again very much for joining us.